Oh, they're just coming in now. Hello! Hello. Um, I'm, I'm aware, aware that it will that it take, take a little time, time for everyone to sign, sign in. So, so um, we will we make, will make light, light conversation, conversation for five minutes and, and try and be glittering, glittering and entertaining, entertaining and light-hearted. Um, but do, but do come, come in and say hello. hello. It's nice to see you're here. here. Um, yeah. yeah. I hope, I hope nobody's having any trouble. So I'm just going to check my email to make sure no one's crying at me. Kind of oh hi Susanna. Kind of lovely to, lovely that you're here. We've had um crazy tech problems all day and suddenly miraculously it's all working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been it's quite the day. day. Hi Emma. Hi Emma. Hi Susanna. Peggy. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we have, have had interesting, interesting times, times today. Am I, Am I echoing for you, Peggy? Peggy? That, is that is really interesting. interesting. Uh, uh, I've, I've already, already tried, tried to solve that, that but, but Marina, Marina couldn't, couldn't hear it, so, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> um, um, Marina, Marina, you don't, you don't have, have earphones, earphones to hand, to hand do you? Um, no. Okay. okay. Sorry. I think, I think hi, hi, hi Callum. Callum. Nice to see you. Um, um, I, th I think we, we might, might not be able to do anything. anything. I'm just, just going to press a couple of buttons. Okay. okay. Oh, hi, Richard. Am I echoing as well, or was it just Catherine? Um... Cool. Thank you. Oh, hi, Nell. <laughs> nice to see friendly faces. Hi. Hi. Am I, am I echoing? No, no, I think I, I, think I am. I think, I that, think might, that might be yeah, yeah, really so. so. I, th I think, think that's possibly Marina, Marina wearing earphones, earphones. Um, and um, she didn't, she have, didn't any. have any. Can you take yours off? Uh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, remember, remember it fed back, back right? Right? So, so if I, if I, if I, if talk, I talk, Marina, and you mute yourself, can you can just, you try, just that? try that? Yeah. Just to just... see if that does anything. Okay, can everybody hear me at the moment when I'm talking? Right, okay. So, Marina, please unmute yourself. <laughs> I think um, what we might do then is um, when, uh, is that if, if you mute while I'm talking, Marina, and then unmute when you, is that okay? Because I think that's what's causing the echo. Okay, echo goes, thank you, you guys, you're really helpful. Um, Right, well, so numbers are just building up. Um, thank you for the troubleshooting. <laughs> uh, we've been doing this all day, so we are quite tired, actually. <laughs> I am so having a glass of wine after this, but I thought I'd better not start early. Um, I've also um, bought myself a special new light because the, when I did one of these last week, um, I was just in complete darkness <laughs> whatever angle I looked at, so I looked kind of veiled and mysterious. Um so now I have I'm staring into this weird halo light that cost me 16 quid on Amazon. So I just want you to all know the sacrifices I make. <laughs> uh, we're going to start in one more minute. Um, oh, hello. 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 It's lovely to see you all. Lots of people I recognize. That's lovely. Um, we have 150 booked, believe it or not, but I know from experience that probably most of those people will listen afterwards. Look, there you go, I've got dark again. <gasps> I've got to stay in the light, I've got to stay in the light. It's a bit like post-death experiences that kind of float towards the light thing. Um, hello, oh, it's lovely to see you all saying hello. It's so nice, so friendly. Okay, so I reckon we can make a little start while, we, um, while you're all getting logged on. Um, thank um, you for coming today. Thank you. Um, what the, the sort of purpose behind this, I suppose, um, is that I have been uh, I've been starting running some courses online over the lockdown break <laughs> break. Um, and as I was kind of planning them, I started to think, well, there's loads of knowledge that I don't think should ever be put behind a pay paywall, but actually that I think loads of people don't have access to 
And one of the big ones for me when I was starting out was how to write a book proposal. Um, it's this thing that you have to do in order to get a publication deal. Um, and yet there's no examples out there because, and I'm just the same, like nobody wants to put their book proposal online because it feels like this kind of intimate, slightly embarrassing thing that you do um, that, that's a, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a spell. Spell. Um, <laughs> every time Marina unmutes, I can tell. Um, and, you know, that means that the information, I don't think, it's, I'm not saying it's deliberately kept secret, but it feels like sort of insider knowledge. Um, and that's fine if your agent's going to guide you through writing a proposal. But if you want to pitch directly to a publisher yourself, then you're going to need to learn how to do that. And also, like a lot of writers might want to write their proposal um, before they approach an agent so that they've got this document that they hand over. So that's what we're going to share today. We've got a lot to fit into an hour, so we're going to move at quite a pace, but please do feel free to ask a question using the little ask a question tab. I don't know if this is going to work, look my massive finger uh, at the bottom there, um, or that direction, maybe this is coming out differently, um, do add a comment. Um, what we'll do is we'll try and keep an eyeball on those questions and comments. If we don't cover them in the course, we'll try and do them at the end. If we run out of time, I'll do an FAQ on email. Um, so, Marina, would you like to just introduce yourself? Tell us how you, what you bring to the table today. Well, I, I thought it was a fantastic idea uh, of Catherine's to kind of make um, public and explicit and um, dis something something we could just writers discuss among ourselves this business of the mysterious proposal and, and demystify it um and i see my role today i was joking earlier with Catherine. i see my role as the complicator because she's put some <laughs> wonderful kind of um slides together which she's going to share with you which are which will give you the kind of the format and the formula um, I thought my role might be to kind of say a yes, but, and if, and but it doesn't always work that way. So <laughs> that's so perfect. So perfect. Um, and also to share um, personal oh. anecdotes and experience. Sorry, Catherine. It's okay. No, sorry. I'm trying to learn to be quiet instead of like do my natural thing, which is going. Mm, yes, lovely. <laughs> um, and I like I, like Marina. I've written a good few book proposals in my time, so I, I come to it with experience from that end, but also. Part of my day job is I work as a literary scout, which means that I probably read more book proposals than most publishers even. Um, and I read them with the international market in mind. So I'll try and bring that perspective to bear too. But I, the thing that I want to really start by saying is that there is no one way to write a book proposal. There are a few fixed points, but everybody does them differently. Every agency does them differently and if you do have an agent they will tweak your proposal which is obviously really helpful um and so really they should feel a little bit idiosyncratic because they're selling you and your book and that's very specific to you and they will be received by a range of different people too all of whom will have different tastes and preferences so don't think that this is about teaching you a very fixed position would you agree with that marina yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think in some ways, you know, it's the the job of the proposal is to rise above the formula, in a way. Mm. You know, there are yeah. certain components that a proposal has to have to it, like the limbs on a on an animal, um, in order to kind of walk the book through the door for you. But really, the trick of it, in in a way, is to transcend the format and really shine and be something that feels kind of unique and distinctive. Definitely. Definitely. So I've got some slides which I'm going to share with you um, as we as I talk. Um, sorry, I'm completely incompetent this so I'm only just learning how to do it. Um, now present. There we go. So these these are downloadable afterwards. Oh, I've uh, no, you see, I have screwed that up. I am just going to start that process again. <laughs> um, these are downloadable afterwards. Um, so please don't uh, worry if you miss anything. We are going to be uh, going through them pretty quick. Um, ah, this is stuck. OK, let's uh, unshare my screen <laughs> for a moment. Uh, 
I will um so Marina like while I'm sorting the slides out would you mind just starting off by telling us the kind of um like moments when you might need to write a book proposal the kind of different situations you might need to write one in or or the different people that are going to receive one unmute you were muted sorry you were muted sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think Many people who might be joining us this evening perhaps have published novels before um, and with a novel you usually write the whole thing and you don't have to sell it on proposal but it's perhaps both a blessing and a curse that with a non-fiction book you can sell it before you've written it. Um, it's a blessing in the sense that if you do sell the book and you get an advance then you are effectively paid to write part of the book or most of the book. Um, the curse is that um, you're having to be in a position writing the proposal of having to um, convey the whole flavour of the book before you've embarked on uh, on writing it in full or when you're halfway through it or certainly before you've finished it. So um, we're going to come into that later in much more detail. Um, most of the time you'd be writing this book proposal initially as a flag-waving endeavour to draw attention to yourself to get yourself an agent who will then sell your book on to a publisher but sometimes it may be the case that um, agents and publishers chatting as they do over lunch or at book fairs um, will will come up with with a, a pitch for you that they would like you to write a book and and then you'd have to come up with a proposal but basically it's a commission um, so it can work that way around as well. Um, yeah, it's useful. Sometimes agents put proposal directions up on their websites and that can be helpful. But um, I can't think of anywhere where I've, I've seen the breakdown of, of in written form of, of what it takes to write a proposal. Um, no, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think I've worked, think I've worked for half so I'll do that. <laughs> um, so, oh, you see, I've immediately got confused. Um, so what I'm going to talk you through are the kind of main features of the proposal, first of all. Um, and that, I'm going to present mode. That is, uh, there are some sort of standard elements that need to be in every book proposal. Um, and they are a title page. Um, I mean, I know that sounds like a really basic thing, but do make sure you have got a cover page on it with a title and subtitle. Make sure your subtitle is useful so it reveals something about the book, your name and your, your agent's contacts if you have one. And do include a contents list at the beginning as well, because this is actually, it becomes quite a chunky document. Um, and it's really um, easy to get lost when you're reading these things. They're actually... Uh, they're actually quite substantial when you have to review them. Um, after that, and, and this order is quite deliberate. After that, you'd provide an overview or outline. I'm going to go through these in more detail as we go along of the text. Um, and then an autobiography, a note on the extent, which is like your finished word count and when you can deliver it by. Um, don't be surprised if that becomes open to negotiation. <laughs> Um, and then an outline of your chapter, kind of a blow by blow account um, of, of all the chapters you're going to write with some detail on them. And then a sample of your writing, a chapter sample. There are some optional elements as well. Different people want different things, but you might want to include these optionally as well if you feel like you can really shine in these areas. So they might be. And, and again, we'll, we'll put some more detail on, detail on these, but um, a market analysis. Um, so looking at your audience and any comparable books, um, a list of your platforms and media contacts and any endorsements you've got from, um, say, writers or experts like that dreaded word influencers um, or kind of big industry figures who could help you along. They can they can really help to sell your book. Um, and one of the things that I want to really put across here is it really helps to imagine your publisher's line of interest as they read through it. It should progressively give more details and answer their questions as they go through. Um, and therefore, you, you're kind of second guessing what you think they're going to say. So let's go into a bit more detail. Um, Marina, what do you think this kind of overview or outline 
really needs to land it's quite quite an intense moment I think I think this is this the worst bit for uh, to write would you say for me um, for me um, the yeah, worst yeah. bit is the chapter breakdown because oh really, um, oh, really? Okay. yeah <laughs> that's the bit that I think is hardest to bring to life it feels very flat and it takes the magic out of the book and as we all know one of the things that publishers need like to do is be able to imagine the finished product and also to imagine their role in steering it to the best form that it can be in um I mean, for me, really, the overview has has to be full of it's the sizzle, really, the sizzle and the sell. And and it's a bit like a really good pitch for a magazine feature, except it's got to be more substantial than that, um, because you don't want your publisher or your agent to turn around and say, this is this is great, but I'm not sure it would fill a book. So um, there has to be enough complexity there for and enough um you know, hints of deep layering that, that the publisher can imagine that there's going to be, you know, deep wells of interest and narrative beyond what they're reading on the page. But but I think the overview is 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 the real sizzle. It's it's the bit mm-hmm. that gets the publisher excited to read on. And that, that um, um, notion, notion of, of depth, depth, I think, is so important, actually. I, I, I know from a scouting perspective that the last few fairs we've had an influx of books from uh like online journalists I'll say that very generally but it's one publication in particular um where the journalist is trying to convert an article that's been particularly successful into a book um and quite often it's been fairly obvious that there's not enough depth to really fill really sustain that book and and you get a hint of that in this outline but you can get away with it in your outline but it's in the chapter sample that it's maybe really revealed and exposed so this is the so these are the first two pages of your uh, of your proposal um so and it's really important to say it's not a synopsis um i'm <laughs> in, my, in my development editing work I spend a lot of time saying to people writing synopses just write the most simple explanation of what's going on try and cut down on the style actually this moment I'm calling it a moment at the beginning of your proposal is full of style it actually kind of should capture your voice and distill the book it it needs to tell us what happens in a very general way but you're going to go into that more detail later in your um, in your sort of chapters outlines. So you don't have to give the game away. You can you can almost write it a bit like a blurb. You can add intrigue. You can add excitement. You can add interest, and you can also do a little bit of uh, comparison to other you know to other authors. Um, you can talk about the genre in a general way. You can draw out the th- the overarching themes and messages. Um, it's everybody writes this differently there is no one way to do it but it's quite an intense piece of writing um um another way another word that might be helpful i was thinking as you were speaking catherine is to think of it as a proposition you know um for for something to exist and and you have to make the case for it uh, you know very in brief um mm. and and with you know um with all the elements that you that you mentioned depth style comparison with other books um it's really got to do a lot of work this overview so moving on on, um i'm um, just just keeping up pace pace today today. do it with me me. um Um, they you then write your author biog um now this isn't a big deal we've all written biogs before um but in this case, I would urge people to keep it actually fairly brief and very focused on what's relevant. I see a lot of kind of CVs here. You know, this person went to this school and did this degree and have worked in a bank. And if that hasn't got anything to do with your book, then it really doesn't need to be included. Like, I don't care what you've done until you've written your book. Um, what you're really trying to say is, why am I an interesting prospect for this publisher and I've sorry I've put what will your publisher link and understand I meant like and understand but just assert a little bit of your authority to write the book here and make yourself sound interesting tell us the stuff that we need to know about you as an author Marina do you want to comment on that or shall I move on because that's a fairly kind of simple bit yeah okay okay move on 
Um, and so then moving on to the dreaded chapters outline. Now, these can run to really quite a few pages. Um, I've seen some really excellent proposals where there's a page on every single chapter. That's unusual and that's long. Um, but the more depth and vision you can get into this, the better, really. Marina, do you want to talk through this, seeing as it's your most dreaded moment? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think you would probably give it a better a better gloss than I will. Um, I find I've read the proposals that I read. I find that I'm least interested in this, and it's the bit where I think it's most likely to expose your weaknesses. And I think that's partly because, again, coming back to what I was saying at the beginning, this book hasn't been written yet, and you may feel that part of the freedom you want to buy in having an advance so that you can write it is so that you can fully work out what the book is going to be while you write it. So there's a little bit of sleight of hand involved, I think, in the chapter outline. And I think that the failure to convince is one of the major pitfalls of this part of the proposal. Um, one way to avoid it is not to have a book with chapters in it, <laughs> which is what I did last time. <laughs> <laughs> no chapters um and the last time the, the book before that when um when i did do chapters i felt personally that it was probably the weakest parts of my proposal um and that it possibly you know didn't help but hindered um the book's passage into into publication um mm -hmm. and that was really because even though i'd written sort of almost half of the book I still wasn't clear where I wanted it to go. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that can be that can be sometimes an unhelpfully defensive position where you just feel part of the joy of writing is discovering kind of what it is that you want to say in the doing of it. It doesn't help you when you want to write a proposal. Um, so there's a little sleight of hand here. And I think what helps me now thinking about it as I'm thinking about writing a new proposal is thinking that maybe what the chapter outline needs to do is kind of somehow amplify the promise of magic that was in the outline. So maybe to hit on a few kind of really juicy insights, details, originality, distinctiveness, aspects of the book that you think, you know, will make this book unusual and distinct and viable and, and flag those up in the chapter outline so that it doesn't become this flat and then and then and then but but there's enough of a tease in each chapter paragraph that will um will give the publisher some sense of yes i can see this it feels like there's an internal compulsion here yeah, yeah that makes, that makes sense. sense i think um i mean i like i've approached this differently sometimes because all of my books uh, you know, I, for those of you that don't my, know my work, I'm kind of a memoirist who adds extra factual elements. Um, my books tend to be based around a personal kind of project or mission or something I'm doing. Um, and so actually, when I'm writing a proposal, I'm often saying, right, this is the structure of my project. I don't know what's going to happen in the second third. I've done the first third of it, maybe. Or I, you know, I've done the first half. Um I don't know what's going to happen next, but this is where I'm going. Um, and I think, and that's actually worked quite well for me. People have been quite sympathetic to that, which I've been very grateful for. Um, but you do have to minimise uncertainty as much as possible. So one of the ways that you can use your chapters outline is to show that you understand that your book has to have a narrative arc, you know, that it isn't open ended, that you that you know that there's an end point. Um, so just to give the example, like my first um, memoir that I published, The 52 Seductions, um, was a book about my sex life. Um, I kind of feel too old to talk about that now. It was a long time ago. Um, but I it was based on like getting being married for 10 years and realizing that um like we didn't really want to have sex with each other much anymore. And so we started a project to have sex once a week for a year, which I know sounds like nothing to loads of people. Don't at me. Um and we had to kind of seduce each other. And it, it became a book that wasn't really about sex, but it was about love and desire and how to sustain contact with each other over the long term. But so when I pitched that book, I think I was maybe halfway through the project, but I knew I had that weekly structure and I was able to write in the proposal. We're going to carry on doing this, but this is the way it's going. And I'm ultimately looking for an integration. And, and I did get offers based on that. So it's about finding as much certainty 
as you can and proving you've got the content to fill the book. And I and I Emma Darwin's commented here, and I think it's so true. Um, giving given chapter outline is most likely to expose your weaknesses, it sounds like a very good developmental tool for your own work long before you get near sending the proposal out. And I I don't know about you, but I have found a couple of times writing a proposal that my conclusion has been I'm just not ready yet and it's better to go out when you're ready than when you're not would you agree I, I would absolutely agree and I and I sort of think in a way you know I over time I think I, I when I earlier when I was starting out I was very eager to sell the book as soon as possible <laughs> and now my instinct is to do the opposite is actually to write more of it um, before sending the proposal out, because then you're writing the proposal from such a position, different position of of confidence mm -hmm. and clarity, and you know what you you really know what your book's going to do, and it, it's a much easier task if you've allowed yourself to write more of it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah, really that's true. really true. Um, I'm going to move on. Uh, so, um, then comes the kind of the biggest piece of reading and you can see how this has progressed so it's gone from a small uh, distillation of the book in your outline to a bigger expansion of that chapter plan in your chapter sample uh, chapters plan um, and then you move on to your chapter sample which is the the big chunk of your writing that comes at the end and so that's what makes these proposals really meaty documents to read they're often between 50 and 100 pages long they're they're not an unsubstantial piece of work and there's absolutely nothing easy about writing them I'd love to be able to say well here's you know 10 ways to make it really simple it's it's really not it's it's a really substantial investment of time um, and you need to put aside a good few weeks to to write it but it should mean that you're in a very good position um, and actually the other thing to say about that is they are the beginning of a negotiation with your publisher, um, which means that um, your an editor might come back and say, um, OK, well, I love this, this and this, but can you add some of this into it? And might even ask you to rewrite a proposal based on that. I've, I've certainly had that. So the chapter sample, um, a bare minimum would be five to ten, five thousand words. Probably ten is much safer. Um, I'm seeing lots that are longer I, and I'm seeing them longer and longer and longer. And I think one of the things that's driving that is that um, publishers are getting more and more wary of buying books on spec, particularly from an unknown author. I've put at the bottom here, if you're a new author, you might need to consider writing the whole thing. That's not to say you couldn't get a book commissioned at all. Um, without writing the whole thing, but you might actually get better money for it. And so it's really worth considering whether, you know, what that trade off is for you. No guarantees. It's publishing, obviously. Um, so the most important thing for me about when I'm reading that chapter sample is I want to be absolutely dazzled by the writing. This should be your best writing. It should be properly edited. It should not be in any way scrappy. There should be no gaps in it. Um, but that sample should actually take us somewhere. It should take us somewhere meaningful. So I always want to see all of the book's concerns laid out by the end of the sample. And the best ones leave me almost with a, a cliffhanger. Or I mean, I know that's not necessarily true of possible for most nonfiction, but they leave me with a question or a challenge or a, or a sort of cliff edge moment that makes me go, oh, I didn't want that to stop. How do you approach it, Marina? Um, I agree with everything you, you've said there. I mean, really, the test, the acid test for this is that this is, think of it as part of your published book. So this is to be your very best writing. This is going to be the thing that you want the publisher to say, I want to see this in print and I want more of it. Um, and I, I think I used the phrase internal compulsion before, but again, it's the thing that makes makes you want to go on. Um, a piece of writing can have can possess that pull you along as a reader and make and, and make you want more um, yeah. so it's a big ask and um, I just I don't think you should ever embark on writing a proposal for the sake of writing a proposal or because you quite fancy the idea of writing a book on whatever because then you're giving yourself an awful lot of work just to find out actually whether you want to write a book or not you could do that but I think that it can waste a lot of your own time I think the stage to write the proposal, and I'm coming increasingly more to believe this, is after you've already passed what I call the commitment threshold of the book, where it's obsessing you, you have to write it, you know you're going to finish it one way or another, 
um, and and you're in this very strong position. And I, I would just recommend that as your starting point, really, because this is a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. you have to you have to be quite the way. way. Um, Michelle Werrett here has asked how much scope is the publisher likely to allow for the chapter outline to develop and change as the book is written? Um, in my experience, loads of scope, actually. Um, I don't know if you can nod or shake your head, Marina, <laughs> but I, I've always found that um, I like full disclosure, I always change my book loads after the proposal. <laughs> um, they're a demonstration of your of of where, where you've got so far but I've fa I've always found that it's really fine to develop from there and actually that's a positive attribute because you want your thinking to change as you go along um you want to be you want to be changed by the project um so don't worry too much about them being a fixed state of being for your book um they have to be your work so far and it has to be brilliant and inspiring um, but I am right in the middle of chopping up the book that I um, proposed and sold in February and March. Um, it's going to look totally different. But I've been able to have a discussion with my editors about that once it's commissioned to say, do you know what? I I'm thinking of changing it like this. What do you think? And, and, and then that dialogue's open. So it's just got to get you through the door. But I think they're flexible about change. Um, just quickly, the question that says, how about agencies that ask for a 10 page sample, any advice? Um, just give them the first 10,000, uh, the first 10 pages. They always want just the first 10 pages. Um, there's a lot to work of work to do in that 10 page and it's brutal and it's not really the subject of this, but you just have to um, make it as good as you can. Um, I'm going to move on to... Uh, the next section. So these are your kind of more optional chapters. Um, and as I said before, not everybody includes these in their um, proposals. And I rarely see them done well. But when they are done well, they can be really useful. And this is where the perhaps the international perspective comes in, because when international publishers are buying a book um, based on a proposal, they might not really fully understand the audience and market that you're talking to. And increasingly, um, we are seeing people saying in their proposals very specifically, actually, I'm a YouTuber and I've got a massive audience in Slovenia. I don't think anyone's ever said that, but you know what I mean? Like a, they're actually saying, I've got an audience insight that maybe you as a publisher don't have because publishers don't know everything. Um, and they are you know, they try and keep up with as many trends as they can, but maybe they can't. So if you know and understand your audience, um, and if maybe your audience is niche, but nevertheless really engaged and powerful, then you might want to make sure you include this in a proposal because you can, you know, really identify and dig into a market that, um, that a publisher might not fully understand, but you can point them there. Um, and I would say as much as you can use kind of evidence um, or kind of very specific insights and never ever say and I you know you would not believe the number of times that I see this um, oh, I think everyone will love my book it will appeal to both men and women old and young um, it seems like a good idea to say that if you don't know anything about marketing but it actually just makes you sound naive we there's no book that everybody loves um, and that's absolutely fine. That book would be very, very, very hard to market. So the more specific you can be, the better. Um, so, you know, say, I don't know, the sort of thing I might say in this is, you know, I know that my, I know from my social media, my time on social media, that my audience are women. They're between 30 and 65. They love uh, nature. They love the great outdoors, but they might identify as having kind of mental health difficulties. Um, they're really interested in intimate conversations. They read books by X, Y, and Z, and they love watching The Detectorists. Um, actually, my audience does love The Detectorists. That's, a, that's an insight. Um, <laughs> and similarly, if you want to think, talk about comparable books, um, you know, don't overdo this, but it's actually not helpful to say, my book is completely unique and there's nothing like it on the market. That will terrify a publisher. Um, they kind of want to know what shelf it's going to go on in Waterstones. Um, they want to know there's an existing market and audience ready to receive your book, but that you're innovating within it. And that's the trick that you have to play. 
So when you're talking about similar books, you might say, um, oh, to use an example that got used loads a few years ago, um, I am writing the new Fifty Shades of Grey, um, but for but the difference is that it's for a Christian audience, so they don't actually have sex. You know, I mean, I would love to know how that works, but um, it, it's about sort of saying people who love that will love this, um, but here's how I'm doing something new. Um, and keep that very focused again. I read a proposal recently that was quite good until it got to this section, and then she basically listed like every single non-fiction book that had come out in the last five years and said her book was a bit like it and it was like you've lost me I've got no idea what this is that's an explosion in a book factory that's not a you know a story um and do make sure um it sounds obvious but actually it's a mistake that I see made a lot make sure you choose comparable books that have actually been successful and not ones that have bombed um, because actually that's quite a good way of saying nobody's going to read my book if you compare it to loads of unsuccessful books. I might have made that mistake a few times too. How do you approach this, Marina? Do, do you feel comfortable doing this bit or do you ever have to do it? I try to do it. I, 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 I don't know if I do this bit particularly well. Um, and it's partly because if you've written a book about middle age, um, it, which is quite niche, I think, and then you want to move audiences or you want to write something else and you're looking for a new audience. Um, you know, you may or may not bring that existing audience with you. So um, I think it's often hard for writers whose, in, whose subject interest in nonfiction changes book by book. Um, that if you're ploughing a kind of um, definable furrow where, you know, each book progresses from the next and builds a kind of almost like a brand, a, an author brand, um, that this section is very useful because you can demonstrably show that your audience is growing and staying with you. Um, whereas I, I think I have trouble speaking to the same people each time. Um, that the bit about the similar books in your area i think is a very good exercise because it shows that you've studied the area in the way that publishers do so they feel that they they have an understanding with you it's an empathetic thing because they look at books as well uh, and see how they've achieved and what uh, they track vogues you know which which are coming trends and which are fading trends and which trends are peaking um and i'm sure in non-fiction you know we can all think of trends um that have perhaps peaked recently I, I think there have been so many books on kind of bibliomania of one kind or another and lots and lots of books on kind of you know um personal relationships with nature and it you know there there are only so many ways that you can make you can say but i'm doing something new with it mm -hmm. um and i and i and i think you know the there, there are are these vogues and it is worth paying attention to kind of what's in the bookstores and Catherine and I were talking about and actually what what book sales are happening in the bookseller because those also can point to trends when you see you know post-covid for example you know people are, are maybe looking towards buying fewer dystopias and more escapism or you know whatever it is you start seeing those trends in the bookseller yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And actually, I mean, I'm going to, I'll include links at the end, but my, um, if you're not signed up to my um, uh, newsletter, which is about uh, for nonfiction writers, I try and include as much of that, of those kind of trends in there as possible, because in the scouting world, we see those trends come through much earlier. Um, but interestingly, we also see some trends that haven't landed internationally and aren't even selling very well in the UK. And um like nature writer is, you know, nature writing, sorry, is an interesting example of that. Like I, I often fit into nature writing, so I'm absolutely not slagging the genre off, but um, it's never sold well internationally. Um, and actually very few box sell, uh, books sell very many copies in the UK uh, either. And so picking up the trends that publishers are actually really excited to acquire is a, is a very kind of, you know, different art to thinking about the books that you love but your publishers will be looking for you to have a kind of professional interest in the books market and certainly in books around your area and they'll be looking for you to be passionate about reading those books you know like they get put off by people who are snide about the books in that genre because actually publishers never make snide comments about those books they they are you know they're happy passionate readers they're not 
cynical um and i and cynicism never comes comes across really well um i love this chat in the in the sidebar about booksellers because booksellers you know they they really do get a sense of what's shifting and what people are talking about and what people are asking for i think that's so true um i'm going to move on um so the other thing that you might want to talk about is uh, your platforms and and media and media oh sorry marina did you want to say something no okay um <laughs> such a weird system we've got there sorry um if you've got nothing to say about platforms and media that you have don't say anything it's like don't like write a section about how few followers you have on twitter it's actually fine you shouldn't panic about that and i know loads and loads of people who've had books pick, picked up with no platform at all so don't worry about it but don't put something negative in the report um, but if you have a sort of reliable group of first time buyers, just like the first hundred people that will buy your book or who might pre-order, then these are the people to list in your platform section. Um, so obviously social media followings, um, and that includes newsletters, blogs, podcasts, YouTube channels, whatever, however it is you engage. Um, add numbers, uh, but also talk about engagement. I think um, there has been, there's been some burnt fingers over the last couple of years in publishing with books uh, bought from influencers um, who it's turned out don't actually have a very engaged following. So some influ influencer books have done fantastically when I've sold loads. Some of them have absolutely bombed and it's turned out that, you know, that this audience don't want to actually buy or God forbid they're a, they're a kind of bumped up figure based on bought numbers. Um, so I think publishers are much more wary of big social media numbers than they used to be. So don't worry about that stuff. But if you've got great engagement, then that's really different. And I think um, newsletters are now seen as uh, a really good evidence of engagement. They're not passive. Um, any journalistic prep forms or anything like that. So if you publish a column, if you publish articles regularly, um, if you publish on somebody else's blog, that's really useful to list membership of um, professional networks um you know if you're on the conference circuit if you're doing a lot of public speaking um or any personal contacts with somebody else who's got a big platform who might promote your work i read this a lot like i'm friends with ex journalists or ex blogger um, and they'll talk about my book um it might help throw anything at it that you've that you've got um and yeah please take it with a pinch of salt what do you say in your stuff marina when you talk about your platforms, your platforms. i throw everything and the kitchen sink <laughs> at it because um i'm paranoid about this really because i think publishers perhaps pay more attention than they should to the idea of profile um and i've certainly had gaps between books where you know publishers have come back and said to my agent oh you know she doesn't have that much of a profile anymore and it's it's you know absolutely destroying to hear, hear that because building my profile is not really something i put very much time or effort into <laughs> so it you know maintaining it it's chasing it seeking one is is just not something that's very high on my agenda so when it does come to this i know that publishers think that this is very important so I do try and, and, and throw a lot at it if I can. Um, having a journalistic profile really does help. You know, any other kind of writing outlets that you can point to is helpful because you can sell the book through those channels when it comes to it. Um, and, you know, even something like Twitter is useful because, you know, I, I've heard it, I've heard, you know, publishers say the more times you see a book cover on Twitter, you know, you may feel very self-conscious about putting that book cover out there, but the more times you see it on Twitter, people just register it as they go, as they scroll through, whether they stop or not. And then they have seen that book before. Um, so yeah, I, I do this with a bit of reluctance and bad faith, <laughs> but I do try and do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's the game we're all playing now, and a little bit like um, this idea that you know you're uh, creating a lot of work for this book, and it might reveal some holes in your thinking if you're writing a proposal. You know, one of the holes that it often reveals for so many of us is that is the hole in our platform. Um, 
and they are pluggable. You know, there's, it's never too late to start building an audience. You only have to build one audience somewhere and for them to love you. Um, and actually, I mean, uh, you know, like I, I always tell the story of when I pitched 52 Seductions, um, given that the blog had been such a success, I think I had 102 followers on Twitter when, <laughs> when I wrote the proposal. And I was so self-conscious about it and I was really paranoid about it but a the book sold anyway but also the people I did have following me on Twitter at that time were so engaged in the book and every single I think I think I I ended up doing a percentage of it because I think 80% of them congratulated me when I got the book deal and in lots of ways that really engaged audience is much more valuable to you than you know 10,000 people one of whom notices when you've got that that book out so I you know Publishers that say they don't notice platforms at all are probably lying, but I don't think it looms as big in their imaginations as it does in ours. And there's certainly loads of successful authors with, with none. So to summarise, um, Marina expresses this better than me. I'm going to let you talk, Marina, because so what what is the overall kind of thing, quality that your proposal is trying to capture? Oh, you're a mute. Marina, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, not, I'm <laughs> laughing because I, I wasn't <laughs> expecting you to throw this one at me. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> but that's fine because I'll, I'll riff on this because I do think actually, in a way, you know, a book is an argument. A book is something that you want to make a, a case for something um, in one way or another, and it has to it has to stay with you. You want it to stay with your readers. So I think the inimitability and the argument, and the um, I don't necessarily mean a logical argument. If I, when I said at the beginning a proposal is a proposition, then a book is an argument um, you, that argues the proposition in in however creative a way it, you know it, it, it that it can do. Um, but I think I think that in a way you want. The proposal has to end up allowing the publisher to understand the purpose of this book, why it needs to exist, why you are the person to write it and why they absolutely have to have it in their house. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a tall order. But if you feel I do think if you feel if you're whipped up in, in the passion of writing and you write the proposal at the right time, which is kind of maybe peak passion for the book that, that you know, that. But that commitment to it and that persuasiveness does tend to come out in your voice. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's really true. And and I was I was trying to when I was writing this slide, I was trying to think about the quality that the books have that get the market really excited. So like when you when you're a scout, we have books being pitched all year round. We as scouts only look at the hottest books that have already got some traction in the market. Um, and, and with the idea that we're trying to recommend them to our list of foreign publishing clients so that they can catch them earlier than everyone else, that they're ahead of the curve. Um, and when excitement is created around a book, um, the, the, I think the common quality that those books have is often that they're asking a question that you didn't really know you cared about, but you suddenly care very deeply about. Um, that feels massively relevant. They're kind of, and, and that works across all genres, whether it's memoir or history or science writing. Um, it can be factual, it can be creative, but they're asking a kind of question. So that could be anything from, um, you know, how can I find love? How can a woman who is X find love? That That's quite a, a common question to ask, but, but, but people find it very inspiring. Um, to, you know, like, how do we solve the current environmental crisis? Or, um, you know, f philosophically, I don't know, like, uh, can being stoical help us? Um, they ask a, a big, big question that you find that you urgently want to answer. And if your proposal can convey that, I think it can take you a really, really long way. Um, Please do ask questions. I'm trying to um, answer them as I go along. Just um, I, as I say, you can download these slides on the Eventbrite page and I will um, email them out for you tomorrow. But just before I go into any remaining questions, can I please, please draw your attention to uh, Marina's uh, wonderful anthology that she has recently published, um, an anthology of lockdown writing, um, which 
all came about very, very quickly, but has just some amazing writers in. I'm putting my name in brackets there. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about everybody else. Um, it's only £2.40 and all proceeds go to Refuge. Um, I've put a link there to buy your copy. Um, it's available on Amazon. Please do buy it. It's really not very much money. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's going to help out such a lot of people. And it's such a wonderful piece of work, Marina. <laughs> Don't know if, don't know thank you so much, Catherine, for that plug. I mean, it was a real um, <laughs> fun project to do that was basically started off as a pop up blog. And Dodo Inc. said, we'll do this as an ebook. And um, and I said, well, let's give all the money to charity. And um, it would be lovely if uh, if you felt that uh, that you could buy it. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, and I, I, have I have read it read on it my Google and, it's, and it's, it's, it's really, really, really good. good. Um, um, and you, and you, can you can find. find or Marina, or Marina, I think, I think we mute, 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 sorry. sorry. Um, um, you can, you find, can find my links at the end slide, slide as well. As well. Um, and those of you that are thinking about writing your first nonfiction book, I have a course for that that's starting in just a couple of weeks' time. Um, so you can take a look at that and you can also subscribe to my newsletter for nonfiction writers. Um, let us have a look at any remaining questions. Um, I think we've answered most of them. Um, there's a question here, I think, is it from Emma about having a stand a chapter as a standalone publication as an essay? I think that's a really great idea. If you can say, you know, this chapter was published in Eon and this chapter was published in Granta. Um, I think I think you can do overkill on that because the publisher wants to feel they're publishing something original for the first time. But if you have that stamp of publication on one or two chapters, I think that can only help. I, I absolutely agree. And I, um, in fact, I can think of a really good example. I can't really say the name of the book, but um, a proposal came under my nose uh, during what would have been this year's London Book Fair, but actually wasn't because of COVID, um, for a book uh, that I had read one of the articles of in the London Review of Books a couple of weeks before and loved. And so when the proposal came, I was already pre-enthused. And I think I think it can really work like that and it will pre-enthuse your audience as well. Um, so that's that's definitely a great strategy. Um, I am not going to start talking about judging a good book or, uh, agent because unfortunately that will um, that will take the whole a whole different course. And there's other people that can talk better about that. But definitely you're looking for shared interests. Um, and that's you know, it, it's it's a relationship and you're looking for somebody that you get along with and you've got similar ideas to. Um, we had a question earlier, which I've uh, replied to in text, but I think it might be really useful to talk about it out loud. Um, what if your book is heavily dependent on interviews or other people for research? Does that feel like a waste of their time? Um, that's been, I, I can definitely personally talk to that because wintering was really reliant on interviews with other people and also like doing things with other people. Um, and I was mega worried about wasting their time. Um, what I would suggest is to do two or three kind of key interviews, perhaps with people that you have got a better relationship with um, and to rack up the interviews that you definitely want to do in your proposal and make it really clear. But there is an element of risk to this. And I have, um, I've had a previous book that I did, a set, did several interviews um, in advance of the proposal and the proposal didn't get taken up. And I, it was embarrassing. If I'm honest, um, I still see some of those people <laughs> online and I always cringe a little bit. But this is kind of where the commitment comes into your book and your 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 commitment to your book has to be beyond whether somebody else is going to pick it up. And that's that's one of the difficult things about it. But, yeah, I, I did the bit of the book of Wintering where I held the cute door, hibernating dormouse um, before <laughs> before I'd actually sold the book. And I remember being there like I'd talked my way into this um, conservation facility and I was, you know, holding this cute hibernating dormouse and thinking, oh, these people have gone to so much trouble for me. And what if this book is never, ever published? And it, it's it's a it's a heart stopper. Um, Marina, do you want to answer any of these or shall I carry on? I can't hear you. Are you talking? <laughs> um, I I don't think there are any more questions in the question box. There's some in the comments. But, there's some in the comments. But there's some in the comments. So there's a comment about uh, pitching to magazines and periodicals again. You know that that would be a really worthwhile course to do actually because, um, I mean certainly you know my 
Catherine works as a scout. My day job is as an editor on Eon magazines. I've always worked as an editor, and um, uh, so I think of myself as a manager player, and I'd be happy to, to do that at some point if people were interested to do a course on pitching. Um, yes, there's another question there, book. I think, I think um, um, if you if want, you want to, to at, at Maria, Maria, Marina, 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 sorry, I mean, Sound, sound of Music, music. Um, if, you um, if you want to contact, contact Marina, Marina, Marina on Twitter and, and express, express your interest, interest about, about that, that, you might, you run, might run, one. run one. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, did I mute myself there? No. Am I muted or not? No. I can no. hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, well, maybe you'd like to run, to run it with me, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, put yourself yeah, put on mute again. You're quite enough. Quite enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we'd have a think about that. And actually, I, like looking at all of this, I wonder if um, a really good course for me to run next would be like a, a kind of boot camp for writing your proposal. So maybe that's my next step. Um, courses on pitching. Yeah, they're definitely useful. I did a course on pitching earlier this year as well with an organisation called Muse Flash, M-U-S-E-F-L-A-S-H. Um, so they're worth looking up too. I found that really useful. I'm not the world's greatest pitcher, um, but Marina knows all about it and gets articles everywhere. So we'll, we will work out how to get a course online for her. Um, I might help her with the tech. Um, Emma's talking about the Notting Hill Essay Prize. Um, that's a yeah that sort of thing should all go in a proposal actually definitely should have said that any uh prizes you've won or accolades definitely go front and center of any proposal um possibly as a you could sneak it into your um outline if you possibly, you possibly can, can. Uh, but definitely in your biog I, I was going to say, I wish there were more um, British essay prizes because I mean America has the best best American essays collection that comes out annually and is a very fat tome and publishers scout that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we don't have that many outlets here, I think, for showcasing yeah. work of length and quality. Um, so true. So true. But it's a good calling card if you can find if you can find a platform like that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Right, right, I think it's, I think time, it's time for us to finish. finish. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Marie, would, you, would mind you mind muting? muting? Yeah. Um, there's just one last question. Um, is it worth having a writer friend to read the proposal? Yeah, absolutely, always. Um, but with all these things, be really careful of uh, taking feedback from anybody that doesn't know about writing a proposal. Definitely get them to proofread it. But, um, you know, you exercise your judgment on anybody's opinion who doesn't know publishing because they can lead you astray kind of standard writing advice I guess but definitely have someone else proofread it because there's always typos um thank you guys thank you so much for listening I'm sorry the tech has been slightly chaotic still the muting unmuting has been uh interesting but I think it was handled with great aplomb Marina and I hope you didn't mind me saying mute yourself a few times I wasn't, I wasn't very, very, no <laughs> not at all I like being told what to do <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh you used, used to be a school teacher <laughs> right right um, um Thank, thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you everyone night. for coming and for staying and I hope it was useful and thank you for asking me to do this Catherine it was great fun night night, night. night. good night <laughs>